story appears ordinary until you see the core side of it. And what you're looking for is a story behind the news. We bring it to you from Lagos, the commercial capital of Nigeria. Giving you all sides and political stories round the clock. Every detail from the start line to the final whistle. Core TV News, expanding your view. Hello there and welcome to Core TV News on the R. With me, Sabena Izuku. Adele Fayashe has been sworn in as the governor of Ekiti State alongside Olubumi Olushala, his deputy governor. He has sworn in. The heavily crowded event was graced by the PDP hierarchy led by the party's national chairman, Adam Mumuazu, and chairman of his governor's forum, Goswila Fabio, who is also the governor of Akwa Ibom State. Fayashe expressed gratitude to the people of Ekita State for the mandate given to him and promised to repay them with the maximum dividends of democracy. Former head of state Mohamed Buhari has picked up the presidential nomination form of the All Progressive Congress. This comes barely 24 hours after declaring his ambition to seek his party's new to challenge President Kuluk Jonathan in the next year's election. And contrary to widely held view that he may not be able to afford 27.5 27 million naira nomination fee, Buhari said the money came from his account. He later explained that he has always been self-reliant, so he was never going to depend on anyone to help pay for the nomination form. The presidency insists that President Goodluck Jonathan will be seeking re-election in 2015 contrary to an online report of a tenant elongation plan. He also does not seem bothered that former head of state Mohamed Buhari may pose a threat to the president's second term ambition. Senior Special Assistant to the President on Public Affairs, Dunyo Kukwe, told State House correspondent that his principal is prepared to contest against those it described as serial failures. That when you have a, a sitting president and he is interested in a rerun, usually he is given the first right I mean, the first choice of refusal. And you know, the president is here to make to make uh, to make uh, uh, public his desire. But this news from uh, Sahara reporters is absolutely untrue. It is falsehood, and we deny it in all its entirety. It is aimed at, is part of the uh, calculated uh, attempt by the opposition to try and throw everything into the uh, into the arena to embarrass this president. They've done this for the past four years. It has not worked. It has not deterred him. He has remained you know, focused. He has kept his eye on the ball. And the transformation agenda to the glory of God has become a grand success. Their declaration, our participation, is not a threat to us. They have never won elections before. Somebody who has contested four times and failed four times, you know, now, you know, I mean, what, for instance, what, will Buari, what is Buari going to tell Nigerians now? What's the new thing? He was the former head of state, a military head of state. But, but that's, all, that's, all, that's all he has done. But since then and now, what is the new thing he has acquired? What is the new thing, the new story? You cannot compare I will do, I will do, with I have done, I have done. It's not possible. <laughs> Nigeria's largest opposition party, the All Progressive Congress, has laughed all the president's claims that the party's two leading presidential aspirants are serial losers. Party chairman John Odigio Yegun told journalists shortly after Mohamedou Buhari had picked up his nomination form at the APC Secretariat in Abuja that 2015 will be different. 
He insisted that the People's Democratic Party will be faced with its biggest challenge since 1999, regardless of whoever ends up flying the party's flag next year. The Federal Executive Council has held a valedictory session for seven ministers who are eyeing governorship positions in the respective states. At the session, President Gulag Jonathan reeled out the names of ministers he expects to leave the cabinet before his October 20 deadline, even though none of them has turned in their resignation letters. He explained that the cabinet members, led by Information Minister Labarumaku, have all informally indicated their intentions to seek governorship seats. So, seven of us may not be here next week, Wednesday, to, uh, to continue deliberation with us. If their plans uh, continue, but we may not say they are not with us until they formally write to us through the Secretary of Government. As we are talking now, nobody has written and we are not dropping anybody. So people should not say we have dropped ministers. No, we have not dropped any ministers. They are still members of council. But assuming between now and next Wednesday, if they decide to go on with uh, their plans, then they may not be with us. It's only proper for us to at least wish them well, assuming we don't see them again. <laughs> but if they change their minds, they will continue to be, they will be with us. But after receiving the letter and they change their mind, it will be too late. <laughs> so if they have to change their mind, they have to change their mind before, before sending the letter to the Secretary of Government. And uh, so the following Honorable Minister of Information, Labran Marco, may not be with us next Wednesday. Honorable Minister of Health, Professor Mayabushi Chuku, may not be with us. Honorable Minister of State Education, Barrister Ezenwo, Yenson Wiki, may not be with us. Honorable Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, Dr. Samuel Autumn, may not be with us. Honorable Minister of Defense, Senator Mosliu Olatudi of Anikro may not be with us. Honorable Minister of State Defense, sorry. Honorable Minister of State Niger Delta Affairs, Architect Darius Dixon Shaku may not be with us. Huh? Then, then Honorable Minister of Labor and Productivity, uh, Productivity Chief Emeka Wobo may not be with us. I say may because they may change their mind. <laughs> All of us here who have been named by you as people who may not be here by Wednesday. Oh, God Almighty, eternal gratitude for connecting us with you, which has led to our elevation to serve at this highest level of executive authority in our country. For me and Chuku and a few others, who have been here with you for the last four and a half years in these hallowed chambers, going through all the experiences you have gone through as the leader of this country so far. Let me say on behalf of ourselves and our families, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you eternally for the confidence you repose in us and for choosing us among millions of Nigerians to support you in the capacities we have been in the last four and a half years, some shorter than that. I mentioned something here last week when we were discussing the Ebola virus disease conquest by you and this leader and your leadership. That you may not be appreciated now, but sir, don't worry. A time is going to come when this country will celebrate you because from all we have seen, the experiences we have gone through and the talent you have shown as a leader, it is very, very clear that God brought you purposely to stabilize this country and to give us a new direction out of a crisis of several years. President Gilad Jonathan again has frowned out the poor working relations between some ministers and permanent secretaries in the Federal Civil Service. He advised the officials to close ranks in order for the government to function properly. The president noted that the complaints of cold relationships between the political and administrative heads of ministries, agencies and departments were too many to be ignored. Jonathan spoke while swearing in six new federal permanent secretaries before the commencement of the weekly Federal Executive Council meeting. In Listening Abuja. to your brief citations, definitely you've uh, passed uh, 
through the, the training process, and we believe very sincerely that you will do a very good job for the country. I think the key thing that we'll get worried uh, about the civil service and government generally is the issue of discipline and impunity. Uh, these days, you hardly see a permanent secretary querying a director or a director querying a stand director or a stand director querying a principal officer or a principal officer querying a senior officer or officers. And in a system where there is no discipline, definitely you cannot get the best output. Uh, you can't assume that everybody will uh, do the right thing. Uh, filtration passes through a process, and we must be able to bring discipline to bear in the service if uh, we, we must uh, give our country the best. And one of the other things is the ability of uh, farm sex working with their ministers. Lately, we have uh, received too many complaints about cool relationship between permanent secretaries and ministers. If permanent secretaries don't work with the ministers, ministers don't work with the permanent secretaries, there is no way we can do what we expected to do. And away from that, the Lagos State PDP has formally recognized the existence of the local council development area structures in the state as it met with members christened LCDA officials. The meeting, which was chaired by the party state chairman Tunju Shells at its state secretariat, also had in attendance prominent members of the state executive and party chieftains. The Christian of the party's LCDA officials is now a confirmation that the Lagos State PDP has recognized the existence of the SCDA structures. It will be recalled that the state chapter of the party had boycotted elections into the LCDA, but in 2011 participated in the said elections. The party has always insisted that the LCDAs were not recognized under the constitutions. Speaking on the development, the state chairman confirmed that his plans to win the state in 2015, it was unavoidable to participate in the identifying LCDA structures. The political expediency in the state dictates that we must also devolve our mobilization to the LCDAs. He says the APC can no longer blackmail them about being opposed to the creation of more councils in the state. At the event, the party urged the LCDA chairman to be committed and issues a criminal will the local government era chairman to make possible the motive and objectives of the creations. And after the break, 59 soldiers have pleaded not guilty to mutiny charges. Stay with us. Glad to have you join us another edition of The Political Arena, the most detailed and incisive political show. If you are a sitting governor and the opposition is able to stomach structure against you, that means you are wicked to the people. To the end of our time, and the legitimate authority to govern this country. Give me 20 minutes to move or they will shoot me. He has no chance for survival. If he likes himself, this is the best time to get out before it very hard. The PDP is a rule of right to his faith. To anybody who thinks that government will fold his hands and allow miscreants to take over the streets of our own state and cause havoc, is deceiving himself. The good, bad, ugly and beautiful sides of the Nigerian political system. Join me every Sunday at 9.15pm on 40 News. Good to have you back. For more information, you can also reach us on social media platform on facebook.com forward slash call TV news and on Twitter at call TV news ng on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash call TV little space and then news. 59 soldiers have pleaded not guilty to mutiny charges before a court martial in Abuja. The soldiers are all members of the 111th Special Forces Battalion who allegedly refused to go to the front lines in Bornu State to confront the Boko Haram insurgents according to the charge sheets. They are specifically accused of refusing to be deployed in August to recapture the town of Yewa, Belabulini and Dambu from Boko Haram. 
Prosecutor Joseph Wonsoon had told the court he had enough evidence against the accused soldiers, but defense counsel Femi Falano told the court that there was no evidence to back up the charges. He added he was out to prove that the soldiers should not have been brought tried in the first place. The court martial session continues on Thursday. Nigerian authorities plan to honor soldiers involved in the ongoing war against insurgency at the next year's Armed Forces Remembrance Day celebration. Defense Minister Ali Yugusau, who disclosed this at a news conference in Abuja, said it will be a special one because it coincided with the country's greatest security challenges in recent times. He explained that it would also provide an opportunity to reflect on the sacrifices made by military personnel for peace in the country. The Armed Forces Remembrance Day celebration 2015 was a theme appreciating the Nigerian Armed Forces is a special one because it coincides with the Nigeria's greatest security challenges in recent times. It is therefore appropriate to specially appreciate the commitment of our personnel that are paying the supreme price in confronting our security challenges so that we can live in peace. The contribution of the officers, men and the women of the armed forces towards the return of peace to troubled sports in our country cannot be overemphasized. The nation remains eternally grateful to these gallant Nigerians. The Remembrance Day period is therefore time to reach out to the loved ones the fallen heroes have left behind and those who have been incapacitated in order to contribute towards rehabilitating them. The federal government of Nigeria looks forward towards to our dear citizens in both public and the private sectors to appreciate the courage and the patriotism of these service personnel and to support them generously. And away from that, the Nigerian business mogul Tony Elumelu has launched an empowerment fund to revitalize the economies of post-conflict and disaster communities across the country. Speaking at the launch of the fund at the presidential villa, the banker says the intention is to transform communities in the country that are ravaged by natural disaster and violence. In his response, President Gilbert Jonathan commended the gesture of Tony Elumelu, whom he described as a major contributor to the Victim Support Fund. Only two months ago, we launched the Victims Support Fund to provide immediate assistance to our fellow citizens who have suffered the consequences of violent extremism over the last few years. While government continues her humane security operations to eliminate the threat and to restore law and order, we recognize that the assault on that region has all but destroyed infrastructure, displaced the population, and arrested economic activities. Rehabilitating those communities will require interventions, not just from the government alone, but also from the private sector. I am therefore pleased to see that Tony Elmelo and our industry and private sector leaders stepped up to the occasion by contributing significantly to the Victim Support Fund. Their kind gesture was a clear demonstration of how much the private and public sectors can achieve in working together for national transformation. As the government executes domestic humanitarian intervention, relief and rehabilitation efforts in adversely impacted areas, he has also reached out to the private sector. While none of us wish to have a reason to donate to a natural disaster or post-conflict situation, we cannot ignore that these tragedies exist in our homeland. Nigerians are currently witnessing a crisis in Borono, Yobe, and Adamawa. And not only must we act to secure and stabilize the region, we must be willfully optimistic and plan for a stable and prosperous future for our brothers and sisters there. And that is why I decided through the Tony Elumelu Foundation to launch the Elumelu Nigeria Empowerment Fund. The Illuminati Empowerment Fund is a non-profit 
organization that seeks to partner with local citizens to transform communities that have been ravaged by natural disasters, hazards, and conflicts into thriving and economically sustainable communities. The House of Representatives has endorsed 17 new amendments to the 1999 Constitution. This was after the conference report of a joint committee of the Senate and the House of Representatives was tabled for adoption. The motion was moved by Deputy Speaker Emeka Ehedioha, who doubles as the chairman. The House Committee on Constitution Review and unanimously adopted by the lawmakers. Out of 261 members present in the chambers, 252 voted to adopt the report. Eight voted against, while one member abstained. Speaker Aminu Tambuwa, who presided over the session, observed that the House had met the constitutional requirements of two-thirds majority of members needed to amend the Constitution. The World Bank has tasked federal government to increase its fiscal buffers by raising the excess crude account from $4.1 billion to $6.3 billion. The Minister of Finance and Coordinator Minister for the Economy, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Wella, made this disclosure at the end of the 2014 annual meeting in Washington, D.C. She said the federal government is looking on how to strengthen the buffers. One of them is to get resources, which the government is not planning to do. Other options are revenue plans, which the Federal Inland Revenue Services, backed by the McKinsey, to help to strengthen capacity to improve audits and plug leakages by targeting 75 billion naira. Although 44 billion naira was realized in July, the other is expenditure plans. However, the uncertainty of the global economy and the drop in global oil price, the economy is expected to grow at 3.8% in 2015. We'll take another break and when we return, we'll take you outside Nigeria. Stay with us. TV News, expanding your view. Welcome back. The U.S. health officials are seeking 132 people who flew on a plane with a Texas nurse on the day before she came down with symptoms of Ebola. The nurse, the second person to catch Ebola in the U.S., became ill on Tuesday. Both she and the nurse Nina Farm, 26, had treated librarian Thomas Eric Duncan, who died on the 8th of October in Dallas. Meanwhile, the UN Ebola mission chief says the world has fallen behind in the race to contain the virus, which has killed more than 4,000 in West Africa. On Wednesday, the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, said it wanted to interview the passengers on Frontier Airlines Flight 1143 from Cleveland, Ohio, to Dallas, Texas, on the 13th of October. It said it was taking the measures because of the proximity in time between the evening flight and the first report of illness the following morning. And that wraps it up on the news at 7 on a prime time news at 9.45 to keep a date with us. I am Sabana Izoku and thank you very much indeed for watching.